so good morning everyone so uh, two three days back uh, archana called me that uh, we missed this class uh, in our uh, planning uh, this monday uh, 31st of uh, july and uh, what we should do so i just thought that uh, rather than uh, not having class uh, in continuation of what we discussed last time uh, especially uh, in the circum circumstances of cancer patients what uh, are the various uh, things in terms of intervention we can do for cancer pain patient i should discuss so whatever i will discuss is based on the experience what we have gathered in last few two decades uh, there are a lot of evidence uh, a lot of things are evidence based so and uh, this class class also i have my purpose to give you insight that many people ask that what exactly we need for starting intervention pain management in our uh, setting so this class will also give little bit of a uh, uh, little, little bit of ideas that uh, actually what exactly we need for starting intervention pain management services especially when you are working in cancer pain patient study uh this is just a small survey i think i have repeated it many times but uh, this is also again a very important survey we can have this survey i think i was planning when i was thinking of uh, when i was revising my slides i was planning that now we should have this survey for whole of the country and i will ask uh, archana and nisha to send this survey uh interventional pain management services this was done only in the uh in the uh, department and the, in a short short group because i wanted the result immediately and the purpose was to find out the present knowledge and concerns for about interventional pain management technique in cancer patient amongst palliative care physicians so it's, it was a small group but now we will send it to whole of the country uh so first question was do you have any experience in inter interventional pain management so almost 39% people were having experience uh 26 people have performed under supervision uh almost 12% performed independently and there were 21% almost imagine in a short group where i can consider that people must should know everything about interventional pain management almost 20% have not performed at all uh, what do you think about the role of interventional pain procedures and uh, this survey again uh, uh, almost 50% people uh, palliative care physician think that uh, it should be performed and it should be considered early so there is no doubt uh, whether or not but now the question is how to start because almost 50% people say that it should be started Uh, early uh, whenever uh, in a in a ladder when we are planning to managing pain of our patient uh, only uh, 30% people still think that it's a ladder 4 and it should be done in an advanced stage uh, what the, the next question was oh sorry next question what do you think about the role of interventional procedure uh, this i have discussed now okay oh. do you think integration of pain and palliative care is beneficial so everybody almost 100% people uh, 96% people think that pain and palliative care is beneficial and it is required by everyone so uh, then there was a question that what according to you is the biggest palliative care physician apprehension with the use of interventional pain procedure so uh, you can see the biggest interventional pain procedure was based uh, first is a uh, risk of uh, side effects uh, second was fa fear of failure of procedure uh, and uh, most of the people were were uh, were major apprehension was these two and uh, almost 7% people are very brave and they said we don't have any fear of using intervention so uh, there is a big uh, big apprehension in starting interventional pain services amongst palliative care physicians uh Uh, then uh, the next question was what seems to be the biggest hindrance in use of pain intervention procedure in palliative care palliative care and uh, almost it was a mixed mixed answer lack of training lack of infrastructure 
lack of integration of pain and palliative care so there are many places where pain services are different palliative care services are different and they don't talk to each other uh, and so there, it was a mixed of answer of mixed of everything that uh, main was lack of training lack of infrastructure and lack of integration of pain and palliative care services so basically a uh, purpose of the this lecture was to answer all these questions plus uh, other areas which i will address in one, in next 40 minutes are when should we do intervention when should we do we should not do intervention what are the common intervention which we can do for in cancer pain patients what are the evidence available and what can we do to improve coordination between pain and palliative care physician and amongst other teams and how can we create integrated pain and palliative care program so these are the various areas it will not be i will not be able to give you focused video recording of every each and an every intervention but definitely we can assure you that uh, based on various areas like head and neck thorax or lower limb upper limb we will go, we will do that also in subsequent lectures but today we will give you a broad idea that what exactly which intervention we should be using so uh, the most most important thing which i consider that when we plan any intervention patient selection and pain assessment is the most important we have understood that pain assessment is most important if you want to really treat pain in cancer patients we have to assess properly and if you really want to do intervention you have to select your patient properly so the most important uh, thing which work will work in interventional pain patient that pain should be well localized first thing diffuse pain patient also you can see say take because in cancer patient you will find lot of diffuse pain uh, the pain is everywhere so diffuse pain patient also you can take but major component should be limited to single dermatome or one or two dermatome then frequent episodes of breakthrough pain and coming from a single dermatome so this also we can consider for intervention then cancer survivors with a longer half life or longer life expectancy i consider this that definitely we should do in such intervention rather than putting a patient of cancer survivor on medication we should try to do intervention as much as possible and then effective oral analgesia but intolerable adverse effect patient is saying that i get pain relief but it, it, side effects are too much and i just cannot tolerate side effects then also we should try to to do and we should start thinking of intervention so i hope this you have understood that you have to select your patient properly uh intolerable uh, side effects beside this intolerable side lot of medication you have increased but patient is not getting pain relief or pain relief but side effects then also now there are contraindication this also you should not forget sometime patient say i just not don't want needles you do you can't you should not do it local and systemic infection if there is any any kind of local infection or systemic infection please don't do it uncorrected coagulopathy lack of technical expertise definitely don't do it uncertainty regarding the diagnosis you have not yourself you have not understood your patient you have not assessed properly you are not very sure that which dermatome this uh, pain is governed by please don't do it uncooperative patient you will fail so don't do this and then relatives uh, relative contraindication are patient is on chemotherapy and having neutropenia we don't do this uh, these patient neurological deficit must be documented prior to procedure any intervention if patient is even he is having numbness of finger and uh, toes uh, please document it because probably if you will for example if you are you have one uh, brachial plexus block and patient is having already numbness of fingers uh, please document it properly so that whatever you will do if your tomorrow if patient will develop any kind of numbness or paraparesis or pain relief is better but numbness has increased or something so you should have a background this thing that this numbness was present before by medication so this is very important these uh, to to document so these are absolute and relative contraindication now uh, uh, this also a palliative care physicians responsibility to balance it it is not that uh, we have learned intervention from a workshop or today's lecture you start jumping on intervention you have to balance it 
सो फार्माकोथेरेपी का रोल इज मोस्ट इम्पॉर्टेंट बट डेफिनेटली इंटरवेंशन हैज अ बिग रोल इन पेन मैनेजमेंट नाउ प्री प्रोसीजरल असेसमेंट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सो आई विल गिव लॉट ऑफ इम्पोर्टेंस ऑन असेसमेंट बिकॉज आई हैव सीन विद एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ अगेन माई होल लाइफ that uh, if you will not assess the problem properly you will not be able to deal the problem properly so assessment is most important so detail history meticulous physical examination underlying coagulopathy and then informed consent informed consent does not mean that just you will put the paper in front of patient and ask him to sign this is not the way of taking in consent you should sit down with the patient you should give five minutes that what exactly you are planning so for example if you are planning celiac plexus block you have to explain them you have to explain them by the photograph whatever photograph you can make that this is the problem your pain is governed by this uh, plexus and i am going to give this block this block is going to give you relief but it is rather than saying complete relief it, it will reduce your medication because in cancer pain patients any block if you give if we get a successful 100% pain relief we are really we really feel good but rather than giving this kind of a hope we should give that your pain will be relieved significantly and your medication will get will we will be able to reduce something like this so everything plus in during informed consent it is it is important for you to explain about the side effects because like what there is not a single medication in this world which does not got side effects so we should explain about the medication simultaneously you should try to explain uh, 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 everything about the side effects for example if you are giving a glossopharyngeal nerve block there are there are chances that hoarseness of hoarseness uh, uh, of of voice can come there there, there 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 if you are giving celiac plexus block there are chances that transit diarrhea will come diarrhea will happen so all these things you should explain before and while taking inform and you will have to explain in a very sensitive manner it is not that you have explained badly so patient will say no no i don't want in uh, uh, in, uh, any intervention so you have to explain that this happens and we are there to treat this uh, side effects as well if in case it it happens so you have to explain it again it will come by practice and simultaneous confidence building because you know medication lena patient is patient are very comfortable but when you if you plan a procedure patient has got little apprehension because already they are suffering a lot especially cancer patient so if you are planning any intervention it is important to have a thorough confidence building confidence building will come with your uh, when you are taking informed consent and when you have explained everything giving realistic hope is most important explanation of side effect is also important. now planning the procedure the ones who have planned that i have explained everything again I, again I, what i i suggest that you have to reassure and reassess the emotional and psychological status if patient is in the bad emotional status please stop for some time again explain to the patient expectation of the patient what exactly patient is feeling i have seen many a times many a times patient think that if we are doing this intervention we will i will be cured so it is again your responsibility to explain that we are doing this only for pain management maximize comfort for operator and patient for yourself and for patient both should be comfortable whenever you are planning all all patient should be having an iv access and maintain asepsis because uh, in these days most of the time in cancer patient we give bedside blocks but bedside block does not mean that we can do anything on bed but uh, we, there is no need to take care of aseptic precautions aseptic precautions even on the bedside it is important if you are planning something with the uh, cm guidance or ultrasound guidance it is always better to have a radiologist friend so uh, please if you plan to start any intervention in your hospital make your radiologist a team member a person who is open minded who does not have any problems to come in case if, in case of emergency it is not that we are going to call after 5 but during working hours if there is a problem you should be there he should be there to help you similarly radiologist will be required <coughs> in in our setup what we do we discuss everything like uh, in a patient with celiac or hypogastric plexus block if we are planning we will go and discuss with the radiologist the ct scan film and what we uh, what we want to discuss with them that when we are planning celiac plexus block in this patient of ca pancreas or ca gallbladder 
and we want to ask you whether the axis is free and it is not uh, it is not completely occupied by the mat nodes so this is important <laughs> after some time you will understand yourself you will start understanding yourself but always it is better to discuss with radiologists before similarly if you are planning something ultrasound guided and you have done but you are planning bedside with a portable ultrasound but sometime you know because it's a very dynamic structures in uh, when we see sonar anatomy so it is important that if you are not understanding if you are not clear it is always better to have radiologist stand by when you are not clear and this also i will recommend that if you are not very sure if you are not very clear clear please abandon the procedure but don't do this because i have planned and i have started second thing th next important thing planning the procedure withhold analgesic prior to the procedure for better appreciation it is not necessary for better appreciation also but we have seen that if we continue analgesic and uh, on the top of it is to block so whatever analgesic we have given for example we have given morphine um, this will work for 4 hours and you have given block so as soon as you will be blocked patient is pain relief with the block and patient will have lot of sedation so it is important that we should withhold analgesics uh, prior to the procedures to better appreciation and to prevent unnecessary over sedation and we should have uh, alternative modalities always in our mind in, in mind that if i will fail what exactly i should be doing with this patient so this you should always think so there are a lot of responsibilities before planning the procedure give us assurance sedation and positioning it is very important that your resident should give a, you assure you yourself should go and assure and nursing staff they should keep assuring your patient uh, repeatedly because patient will have lot of appre apprehension best, best practice is reassess the need for intervention again uh, you know these three four slides i am spending on this but this is very very important i have seen youngsters they go for a workshop and they want to do everything what they have seen but again best practice is reassess again or even on the table pre procedural screening is very very important that uh, if you are you have discussed with on ct scan access is free but on ultrasound if you want to see again uh, it is important that we should see again that in in a over a period of 2 weeks because the ct scan is 2 weeks before and access was free but now during ultrasound i have seen that there are big nodes so probably nodes have come and uh, again there is no space so again the pre procedural screening screening is very important then next important is trial and diagnostic block this is a good habit of giving uh, uh, a trial and diagnostic block because rather than giving neurolytic block with alcohol and phenol which is going to last for 6 months or 3 uh, to 6 months or rather than do, doing radio frequency ablation which will last for 4 to 6 months it is better very good habit of having a diagnostic block with simple local anesthetic so you know you will have a very good idea that okay this is going to work so after visualizing it is always very ha good habit giving diagnostic block and then therapeutic block by alcohol phenol or radio frequency ablation over jealous approach should be avoided again this is very important that please if you have learned in a workshop please do it definitely because you have learned because you want to practice but uh, definitely uh, you should be very very careful and especially those who are starting uh, they should be very well versed with the process uh, procedure anatomy stand by help everything do not harm by your incomplete knowledge and always remember you should have a help of your seniors or radiologist if there is a need so for becoming a pain physician you have to open your third eye because you have already two eye and if you want to do interventional pain procedure you have to open your third eye so these are various third eyes of interventional pain physician so i still remember when i was doing my md i have never seen uh, this kind of all big big equipment ci arm or ultrasound so we used to give uh, all blocks by surface anatomy like we upper limb blocks lower limb blocks we used to give surf uh, by surface anatomy uh, many a times i can say that the way we have learned 
it used to be successful but sometimes there is our chances of having therapeutically ineffective block then came the fluoroscopy fluoroscopy is a is still a very gold standard people use fluoroscopy uh, but the problem is with the fluoroscopy the bony landmark is a surrogate and and end point and radiation hazards we are always worried about so uh, we have stopped using fluoroscopy and uh, we we are using for selective block but again it has taken a back seat then ct and mri again these are the absolutely a fantastic uh, fantastic equipment to use but hardly even in aims if we want to start practicing ct guided or mri or pet guided we will not be able to get get the slot for our patient so it is not that easy so what exactly we should do we should uh, we should have this is our um, this is our procedure room and uh, you can see everything is there so what we have done we have we have, uh, we, have we have started using almost in uh, 2000 uh, when this this machine was was we have uh, this machine was purchased by medical oncology department at that time portable ultrasound was not very popular and they have not used for one one year then i requested the head of medical oncology that we want to start ultrasound guided block with a great difficulty i took on loan basis this machine and finally we have realized that we have developed so much expertise with our help of radiologist colleague dr tulkar that we have started giving block and now everywhere in our ward in our ot in icu everywhere in every ward we have a ultrasound of, of our own so this is our oldest ultrasound which, which we can say two decades back we have purchased so uh, this is a room which you will feel that everything should be available i will come back to the uh, to you that what exactly you required this i told you this i got uh, after a great difficulty from medical oncologist before this also we were giving blocks and we were trying whatever best we can do in terms of intervention only thing which you need is your patient you yourself your attitude honest information giving habit and your knowledge and your expertise which is required everything will subsequently will come to you only thing you should be very determined that i want to do it honestly you should gain the knowledge first expertise first and then you should start procuring uh, all these things giving aseptic precaution is our habit this is bedside uh, ultrasound guided block celiac plexus block we are giving and you can see that all the aseptic precautions we are following uh, 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 even on the bedside keeping the equipment for resuscitation is very important so when you will come and see our ward one bed is always equipped with resuscitative equipments so it is because even if by giving a simple needling sometime patient can have vasovagal vasovagal by giving a local anesthetic patient sometime may have some kind of a resuscitation required hypotension can happen or anything because they, these patients are sick uh, it is important to have a monitoring suction and supplemental oxygen one bed it should be available all the time it is for bedside procedure and if you are very fortunate enough and you can get the planning uh, procedure room like this then definitely you can do it and i i this history of this getting this room is also a very good history and i want to share this history that this room was very very difficult to get when we first time after 10 years of struggle we got six beds and then we got this room uh, this room was again a uh, cm uh, it was not possible to use cm in this room i requested our uh, surgical colleagues that time head of the department refused to give us ot to for blocks and then we have made the walls so that radiation uh, proof for radiation hazard should not happen to outside people so we have made the wall of this room a uh, radiation proof wall and then we started using cm uh, this got, this i got uh, this room for almost after 10 years but you know in recent when we developed national cancer institute we got one independent ot for 24 hours we can use 24 hours we have cm we have ultrasound we have radio frequency evaluation everything is available and so this will this this will come only by by proving yourself that a uh, intervention which we are doing is very very useful for the patient and automatically 
even administration uh, even whatever policy makers in your hospital they will provide you all the all the equipment all the places all the infrastructure once you will prove yourself that yes this is useful and uh, they whatever they are doing is for the betterment of the patient and they have proved enough so this was a great difficulty 10 years we got this room but in national cancer institute i don't have a photograph right now but in nci jajjar we got a beautiful ot with all the equipments ready made so uh, this is what the what we have come uh, come over a period of 3 two and a half decades so this comes with a lot of efforts is required a lot of determination is required that we want to do it and we our patients uh, because we have uh, there is no dearth of patients everywhere patients are lot of we have lot of patients once we will start working everything you will get uh, but only thing you should be determined that i want to do now uh, in next uh, uh, 10 15 minutes that what are the various blocks which we can give so uh, there are a lot of modalities but mainly two things which we can do targeting the spinal canal uh, spinal canal or targeting the nerves so tar targeting the spinal canal two blocks will come intrathecal and epithelial and for nerves various neurolytic blocks will come now uh, what are the what are the various blocks which we can give so these are the various blocks which we can give uh, peripheral nerve blocks percutaneous epidural or intrathecal and sympathetic block so uh, all these things uh, this just remember this and i will i will show you some more things so what are the peri peripheral nerve blocks which we can give uh, so mainly for head and neck cancer we can give glossopharyngeal nerve block mandibular block and maxillary block for, so here i tell you that a patient with a tongue he has come with the pain which is moderate to severe intensity but he is saying that it is just localized over here please plan glossopharyngeal nerve block because whatever you do if you are giving morphine or other medication patient will be able to get pain relief but he will say that while swallowing while while deglutition still i am having pain so and if i yawn if i uh, cough definitely i am having pain so this this patient will definitely get good pain relief with glossopharyngeal nerve block initially diagnostic and then radiofrequency ablation so similarly mandibular and maxillary nerve block for head and neck cancer patient really do really do, do wonders again it is important that local anatomy should be proper there should be no local infection because a lot of head and neck cancer patient you will find that they will have inflammation at the area of maxillary and mandibular where the nerve will pass so in those cases this is contraindication i have already told you but a simple uh, patient those whose anatomy is not distorted patient is having growth inside uh, and it, and they, it is it is definitely a, uh, de definitely the nerve the pain is passing through the nerves which are governed by maxillary and mandibular nerves definitely patient can have good pain relief so mainly in head and neck cancer we, uh, these three blocks are important plus stellate ganglion blocks is very very important where stellate ganglion block is not going to be helpful for head and neck cancer especially but when patient you get, you know when we get a uh, uh, patient with ca lung uh, uh, and they are having, uh, they are having a lot of uh, neuropathy because of uh, because of the brachial plexus involvement and the the whole arm is uh, getting uh, numbness plus there is a lot of uh, 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 this is um, chronic uh, regional pain syndrome all these patient will get relieved with stellate ganglion block Brachial plexus block again is a very important block and very easy to give. Uh, we used to give with surface anatomy, but now we have got uh, ultrasound, portable ultrasound. I I think many of your hospitals must be having portable ultrasound. Most of you must be having, and if you are not having, start giving blocks, start planning it, and portable ultrasound is really really useful for giving block. So brachial plexus block is plexopathy, and uh, um, it is mainly useful in plexopathy whether it is radiation induced plexopathy or it is because of uh, after surgery that this problem has come brachial plexus block is very very important very very useful for for the patient intercostal block intercostal block is a one which definitely we should be using 
for for example a patient with single rib metastasis has come single rib metastasis for any reason rather than giving medication and to overdosing medication patient will keep saying that when i take deep breath when i uh, when i move there is a pain pain is relieved when i'm uh, when i'm not doing anything but as soon as i move or do any activity i am having pain so for intercostal uh, for single rib metastasis or a single lesion in the rib around the rib or in the lung definitely plan intercostal block give diagnostic block first very simple to give give inter uh, just a local anesthetic patient will get relief patient will say that oh first time i am i am able to take deep breath then i am able to who there is no pain and then do our radio frequency ablation the celiac plexus and splanking now block these are very important block for upper uh, abdominal malignancy so gallbladder pancreas stomach this really works wonder because these patients are very sick when they are having severe pain they get relieved with morphine paracetamol but definitely if pain is localized and you think that it is the only cause of pain with the plexus involvement please try to give celiac plexus block you can try ultrasound guided those who are not having ultrasound guided and very familiar with uh, cm guidance definitely you can try so and the in this in these patients these blocks were do wonder again do diagnostic block with local anesthetic and in the second sitting or in the same day after 3 4 hours please give a neurologic block with alcohol or phenol whatever you are available is planking now block we have to give with cm guidance and uh, we can't give with ultrasound guidance so plus when 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 celiac axis is not free and it is mated with the node we give a splanking now block because it then then again patient is very very in severe pain and he is not getting good relief with celiac flux uh, he he is not getting relief with medication then we give splanking now block epidural steroid and caudal epidural uh, there are so many uh, so many patients are getting benefited with epidural steroid and caudal epidural if pain is governed by uh, you know uh, they, they usually epidural steroid is used for uh, non malignant pain but in malignancy also if uh, something is protruding from the spinal cord from the epidural space or caudal space is 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 is, occup, uh, is governed by the pain uh, is responsible for the pain then we give epidural steroid and caudal epidural hypogastric fluxus block is given for lower malignancy uh, patients like uh, uh, ca um, ca cervix ca uh, endometrium uh, these patients again get very good pain relief by simple diagnostic block as soon as they get diagnostic block you can give neurologic block ganglion implant block i want to give lot of emphasis that patient with ca rectum we get lot of patient with ca rectum they say i am having severe pain in perineal region and you must have you everyone must be uh, uh, visualizing that a patient come in your opd sitting like this always he says that i just cannot sit and i am having severe pain in my perineal region so all these patients get good pain relief with ganglion simple ganglion impar block and you know again uh, by giving opioids and other medication we make sometimes their life worsen and uh, how because they get constipation and once they for example ca rectum patient is having constipation you can imagine that he will uh, we have in, increased the suffering even if we give laxative they just cannot pass properly because then they start having spurious diarrhea because the growth is so big that the they just cannot pass easily so for these patients ganglion impar block really works wonder we should give diagnostic block first and then a uh, therapeutic block so uh urolytic basically techniques first works for the spinal nerves and i want to show this photograph to you i uh, skip two three slides this is a girl uh who was having she was having a spinal cord soft tissue sarcoma means like it was it was coming from the uh, uh, uh from the, uh, the uh, from the it was a back uh, spine uh, soft tissue sarcoma and all the nerves were embedded so much that she was completely paralyzed and she was in severe pain and we tried everything we tried all medication we tried epidural and one day 
uh, Seema gave her uh, gave his spinal and she did spinal neurolysis for this. Uh, so the, as soon as she did spinal neurolysis, she already patient was paralyzed because of the problem. So we we don't do spinal neurolysis because we are worried that patient will get paralyzed. But in circus in such circumstances, when patient is already paralyzed but screaming in pain, the we can give something we can do something better for the patient by doing a spinal neurolysis so we did a spinal neurolysis and see the smile of the patient she was smiling and uh, she went home uh, nicely so intrathecal medication again you have to learn with the practice intrathecal everybody i think all anesthetists they know how to give spinal so uh, uh, and how to give epidural epidural and spinal these are the two techniques which are very very very, very useful for for multiple reasons if patient uh, pain is of lower limb, uh, lower limb, lower uh, upper, uh, lower abdomen, definitely we can try epidural, we can try spinal. But now we should know what exactly we should do next. So uh, we should have a proper idea. So uh, whether we have to do chemical neurolysis, whether we have to do, whether we have to put a catheter, which uh, because if life expectancy is three to six, three months or few weeks, then definitely. We can do percutaneous through cut tunneling and we can, uh, in epidural space, we can keep pushing medication whenever required or we can do intrathecal or implant. Intrathecal implant, again, is a very, I'll come back to the intrathecal implant also. So uh, these are the photographs. I don't think that I should discuss all these because now the time is going fast. All these dermatons, these slides will be there with you. Uh, this is celiac plexus block. Uh, again this uh, just to explain you anatomy all these are anatomy just to explain you ganglia nympar block uh, again this because this uh, basically, basically needle should be between the rectum and the, uh, the plexus this is a photograph of I want to show you that uh, how we can do benefit by uh, thinking a lot about the patient this patient was a patient with the uh, uh, soft tissue sarcoma we amputated her she was disease free she is still alive she was disease free and uh, but she was having severe severe phantom limb pain and uh, uh, phantom limb pain and phantom limb sensation she used to come to our opd again and again we have tried a lot for her but nothing was working so one day we just thought that we should give epidural we gave epidural and she got good pain relief over and she was very happy. So we thought that we should try uh, uh, some uh, intrathecal implant for this patient. And uh, the dose which, which we, she was requiring was almost 300 milligram per day oral dose. So uh, when we tried intrathecal implant, she was requiring only one milligram per day because the intrathecal dose is 300 times less. Because by giving reason, uh, this kind of uh, Central axial block, you will reduce opioid drastically. Uh, imagine a patient who is getting 300 milligram oral, she will need only one milligram intrathecal. So with one milligram of intrathecal dose, she got good pain relief. She was very happy. She used to work. She, she used to come for follow-up. She used to say that I am working whole day and I'm doing everything. She, she used to say that I'm also doing Jadu Pocha. I was very, I, I used to get amazed that how she's doing Jadu Pocha. But she said that I was, I'm doing everything. I'm cooking. I'm doing all the uh, now household work, but I'm pain free. So this is the way we can make a huge difference in patient's life by putting so, sometimes because we will not be able to do all the patients. We will not be able to give intrathecal implant to all the patients because it is expensive. When we put this intrathecal implant, the cost was 2.75 lakhs. Now the cost is 5 lakhs. But you know, if it is going to make a difference, huge difference, you need to think that patient is going to survive for a long time. And if you can arrange money from various resources or if patient can afford, please offer this kind of a modality to your patient. Patient is still alive. Imagine it's almost... 10 to 12 years back, which we have, we have put this implant and patient is doing very well. So this is this kind of miracles we can do in patient's life by thinking a lot and thinking a lot about the patient. Then vertebral collapse. 
uh, a patient with vertebral collapse comes to you and uh, you do everything for the patient but patient keeps saying that i am having severe pain and i just cannot do it. in a vertebral single vertebral collapse <coughs> you keep doing everything it is always better to take the help of your neurosurgeon or orthopedician if they can fix this is the best which we we have done in multiple patients they can fix they can start walking they start giving gaining confidence and then they start getting treatment from oncologist this is very important but if you think that it we cannot uh, neurologist or neurosurgeon or uh, orthopedician can't do this then vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty will be very very helpful we have done in uh, in intrathecal implant we have put almost in 20 patients and what kyphoplasty and what plasty in these days we are not doing but we have done in five patients these are the variety of blocks again uh, this is a old data uh, for two years uh, and this pur purpose of bringing this slide is that out of 2000 patient in 30 29 almost 30% of patient we used intervention <laughs> to relieve patient better and to reduce medication and these are the various blocks which we have given in all 30 patients so uh, the problem is that <clears throat> if you go and try to do it there is lot of there is hardly any literature available in intervention especially in cancer patients so because there are the, because you know randomized control trial doing a randomized control trial in uh, in advanced disease cancer patient is uh, always difficult and when it comes to uh intervention it is more the difficult so large well to find randomized control trial is difficult always there is a issue of ethics feasibility cost and reliability exclusion of all other well designed observational study uh, from guidelines so there are hardly any guidelines and somebody has done observational study but the veto guidelines does not include and definitely patient person who has done individual experience with the expertise hardly there it is not included in the guideline so it is always it is always very tough because whenever we do any think of intervention in cancer patient and if you want to search the literature you hardly get any uh, articles so <clears throat> literature is very less in terms of cancer patient in terms of inter intervention in cancer pain patients so you have to create inter uh, literature you have to create evidence so what evidence we have created i will go into the next few slides the first articles which we have published integrated pain and palliative care model was published in india again uh, uh, in this rural palliative care then uh, this article basically emphasized that early and efficient pain control in conjunction with palliative care leads to better outcome of curative therapy and increased cancer patient survival and next next outcome was optimal pain management in all stages of illness interterminal infection will allow patient to live as actively as possible it was just a simple article this is a <clears throat> this is a data of almost uh, from 2013 to 2018 five years data and uh, this data basically particular purpose of bringing this data is procedure done in the ward and morphine consumption so we have uh, we have correlated that with the procedure with the increasing number of procedure morphine consumption uh, the daily dose daily requirement of morphine drastically reduced if we we are doing procedure in a right patient in a right manner so if we really want to help your patient by by, redu for, by reducing medication if you really want that our medication should be reduced please plan interventional pain procedure which is relevant for the patient this article which we have published in radio frequency ablation in intractable head and neck cancer patient uh, uh, uh maxillary and mandibular nerve block uh, block uh, for head and neck cancer patient and glossopharyngeal nerve block for uh, base of thumb published in oral oncology this is a uh, uh, this is a photograph an article published in uh, inter for a intractable pain in patients with single rib metastasis intercostal nerve block so this was again published in american journal of hospice and palliative care where we have shown that in a single rib metastasis or a localized lesion radio frequency ablation really works well and it decreases uh, uh, improve quality of life and decreases medication drastically 
This was our first publication on ultrasound, bedside ultrasound at radiological boom for placement of Nublock. It was just a general instruction, general in information. Then first we started publishing our papers on uh, uh, ultrasound guided block after getting ultrasound machine. Uh, this was first observational study we published in uh, in the uh, upper malignancy and what we have again, uh, the consistently the results and the emphasis and the conclusion was it improves quality of pain relief plus decreases medication. Then we published this paper on uh, because uh, on single needle versus bilateral needles. Initially, everybody used to put two needles for uh, giving ultrasound guided celiac plexus block. What we have found that by giving uh, by putting single needle, the drug spread was equal on both the side, and which we can visualize on real time images. And what we have published is that uh, it was a trial that single nurses versus bilateral needles and de definitely if you are putting one needle and two needles definitely patient will be benefited better by two by single needles so this was a paper then this public paper we published in uh, superior hypogastric fluxes block ultrasound guided again the conclusion was that it improves quality of pain relief and decreases med added medication now this paper which we have published particularly uh, for the uh, because you know for uh, for coming into the guidelines, it is so tough. Observational study doesn't work. So we have done a study to show that definitely whatever we are doing, ultrasound guidance, it is spreading, drug is spreading on both the sides properly and patient is getting relief. So what we have done, we have given block ultrasound guided, but these patients used to be in the CT suit and we used to see the CT images and you can see that the drug spread was beautifully on both the sides. So this we have published and this we have proved in the Journal of Gastroenterology, this paper was published that uh, ultrasound guided work, block works better is well and the drug spread was absolutely at the place where we needed for pain relief. So whatever you do, we have to visualize the landmark properly. We have to, we have to be very sure that where we are, decrease in, uh, we are where inserting our needle is at the right place and we should not do anything which is going to create problem for the patient. This was a paper which we have published for a patient on four posts for a thoracotomy scar pain. Patient is, was having patient is patient was pain relief. She, <coughs> she is still alive. Uh, she was having case of C lung thoracotomy. Uh, patient was having severe uh, any without loose clothes or sometimes just covered and she used to severe allodynia severe pain are uh, even touch of clothes used to cut pain and be given uh intrathecal uh sorry uh, uh this uh, uh this, um, we have done uh, uh, uh this uh, uh radio frequency ablation this which which works on radio frequency ablation and we have given peripheral nerve field stimulation for this patient and we have put implant and recently she has come, she came, she was having second malignancy that is on, a, a, she was having second, uh, she, she used to, she was planned for second surgery for, for the, uh, for the um, uterus. And then that time it was already the, the peripheral nerve for the field stimulator almost, was almost 12 years old. The patient was absolutely pain free. So we removed this and we did second surgery for this patient. So uh, such type of pain relief we can give for certain group of patients. Uh, this was a paper which we published, uh, 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 and you should definitely go through this paper if you really want to learn the history of celiac plexus block. So uh, this paper gives a lot of uh, the whole journey of celiac plexus block, the old technique with the new developments. And this was published in a leading journal of pain that is Pain Physician in 2021. Definitely, I recommend that all of you should read. I told you that lady which we used to come with see, uh, this where we put CV, peripheral nerve field stimulation. This was the lady. We put we put two two wires and gave pain relief to this lady. This she survived. She is still there. She is still surviving. It's almost 15, 20 years back. Which and after 12 years we removed this these wires because no one was uh, ready to do surgery with this implant because they were not understanding. And obviously, the life expected life of this implant was uh, implant is only ten years. So we removed this implant, and she got operated, and now she's pain relief. This was a person with the uh, cervical neuropathy, 
and again we did peripheral nerve field stimulation she he was a driver by profession it was very difficult for him to wear the even the belt so it was it's like his quality of life is was worsen so we we did peripheral nerve field stimulation again this is a patient still surviving and doing very well again uh, there are now i have only 10 minutes i have to fast go through when we started doing scrambler therapy which we were one of my phd student did a uh, thesis topic was there so first pub paper we, we published on impact of scrambler therapy which works on the principle of tens so it is not necessary that you should have a machine like this but tens machine is very easy to buy so intractable neuropathic pain intractable neuralgia chemotherapy induced neuralgia really work tens really works wonder so it is very easy to learn also so uh, this uh, this was a, a paper which we published impact of scrambler therapy on pain management and quality of life of cancer patient initially we published 20 patient then again we published again in a leading journal of pain and pain uh, pain practice that if evidence for of uh, efficacy of uh, scrambler therapy uh, we did systematic review again i request and i recommend that everybody should go through this paper so that they have a complete idea what exactly it is and then we published the randomized control the actual thesis which komal has done uh, on uh, patients and then we what we have found that by giving scrambler therapy uh, of head and neck and thoracic cancer patient patient's pain was relieved and uh, they were getting they were the, the quality of life was better and uh, opioid consumption drastically reduced so uh, this is this was in another paper which i found that by giving a double blind controlled uh, uh, endoscopic guided ultrasound uh, i don't think that we will and then this was a paper which we published on early ultrasound guided again in pain practice early ultrasound guided neurolysis on for gi malignancy so this is my last slide of course i want to at least take a few question that best practice is to reassess need of intervention pre procedural over zealous we should not have over zealous approach those who are starting they should be very confident they should have a help uh this is post doctor post procedural we have not we, we are not finished that we have done everything post procedural follow up is very important early diagnosis of complication makes a huge difference if patient is having diarrhea give fluid give, uh, ask him give confidence that this is a transient diarrhea after giving cinec plexus block and it will get relief reassess pain relief and be assured of patient barriers will always come uh, we must try to define uh, definitely uh, break the boundaries between pain physician and palliative care physician patient care will be benefited by close interface between pain and palliative care physician we have to create evidence because otherwise the world will not listen to us interdisciplinary pain rounds are to are definitely going to make a huge difference because when we you are there everybody is there and we can decide by based on the information from various uh, various experts hospital based pain and palliative care policy will make a huge difference routine bedside teaching is very very important because everything we cannot teach every day so it is always there that you know, during the rounds you should have a habit of teaching your juniors dedicated teaching and training on bedside ultrasound will make a huge difference we are doing a a, a, a workshop on in the month of august if you really want to learn all these all these please uh, uh, ask to sarita or send it to me i will send archana the details of the workshop it is basically onco anesthesia conference but we are doing a workshop on ultrasound guided block for chronic pain as well as uh, cm guidance as well as sound guidance please join that if you really want to learn ug pg care we should not forget that opioid is ultimately main step for these children these kind of children we will not be able to relieve pain by giving blocks so you should continue to achieve excellence in giving uh, safe use of opioids this is a uh, uh, this work by seeing all these publication uh, the iasp that international association of study of pain invited me for having a ultrasound guided block which block workshop over there and i did that uh, with all the group of people in boston so by giving good pain relief you can get your smiling patient and you will get blessings thank you very much and i'm sorry i have taken a lot of time i wanted to say so many things but uh, now it's only 6 minutes to take question answer if there is any question answer please question please i am ready to answer 6 minutes we can do wonders please ask uh,
are there any question chat box good please pass on these all these compliments archana to me sure ma'am i'll do that so nandini uh, you want to uh, do you think that what you have asked last time i just thought that i will absolutely sushma this was the, <laughs> this is what you know like it quenched my thirst because very often we just jump into the intervention and mostly people need to understand the whole background behind it and you have covered it beautifully and so thoroughly and you know coming from you with so many years of experience i hope everyone takes it seriously and uh, follow that and i really hope that you didn't have just one class i wish you know that you had uh, um, spanned this out across maybe two or three classes so that you could really do justice to so many things um, regarding each area like you know head and neck abdomen thorax so something like that is it possible at all i was wondering definitely uh, nandini this we will do that uh, we will uh, cover area by area and we will show the video graphs so that those who cannot attend who are unable to attend the workshops and all i think we will do we will try to cover this in our uh, subsequent lectures thank you so just i got i got a slot arjuna was very uh, very uh, very uh, distressed that i forgot i completely what should to do can we declare that we will not have any class i said no 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 we will, i'll take a class that was uh, our uh, good luck yeah thank you sure. and uh, please book one seat at least for uh, our department in your workshop in office definitely office. definitely i i'll i'll send it the information to arjuna and she will send it to you thank okay. you so uh, there is one baxter pump definitely baxter pump ka ye jo amit ka jo uh, hai that epidural catheter with baxter pump yes elastomeric pump really works amit i have not given a lot of things i i it was hardly any time so uh, for few patients if you feel that patient is having a uh, very limited life expectancy and they are getting relieved by local anesthetic baxter pump say we can send patient home and uh, it's a collapsible or uh, disposable pump we will post the details excellent uh, okay good question any questions please we have 3 minutes uh so uh, today i will give you send you the details of if anybody from our department if they are having right now uh the link is post in the chat box otherwise i will put i will send it to archana i don't have link right for the workshop can anybody can anyone send the chat link of today for the workshop so yeah what could 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 question me अमित तुम इलास्टोमिक पंप के बारे में क्या बोलना चाहते थे बताओ गुड मॉर्निंग मैम एक्सलेंट प्रेजेंटेशन आई जस्ट वांट टू आई हैव सेंट फ्यू पेशेंट ऑन एपिडोरल कैथेटर विद बैक्सल पंप बट मेनी अदर कोलीग्स दैट इट्स नॉट मेडिकली सेफ medical legally safe to send patient with epidural catheter in c2 like i have put oh that under the uh, medical uh, legally kya medical legally safe again I, i think this is such a useless term if you have i gave you six seven slides initially if you yeah, have explained properly to the patient have commented everything and i have mentioned everything ah, and that there is no problem it, documentation so that yeah, patient is but Uh, that other like anesthesia colleague said that don't send any patient with epidural catheter so if you are sure that what you are doing is correct is... that patient was happy relative are happy everything But is fine then it's all it should be documented that's all that why do you listen to others complain just for the sake uh, ah, like no, 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 no. we have to be very sure i have told you by given at least bar bar that we have to be very very sure that what you are doing is right for the patient that's all Ma'am, that for patient it was right, but just for the institute policy, like everyone said that don't do this. So I have to follow some rules. So, so I so, just uh, want to: is there any policy uh, medically for sending patient with epidural catheter at home? 
no no there is no policy and don't ask for it because already end of life care policy banane mein hamara koi itne saal lag gaye iske liye koi policy nahi banegi iske liye you have to be very confident uh, yourself what yeah, you are that doing. i've everything so it is 730 and the uh, seema ne dal diya that the conference name is subsequent to, to 2023 but the link i will send definitely of the workshop okay thank you very much and thank you archana i'm so happy for giving me this opportunity and there was a second slot and i just thought that i should utilize this slot thank you very much and thank you nandini because last time when you asked i really realized that this was the most important information which you should have given first thank you for so i utilized this time thank you very much see you everyone next week before 6:30